Hey, it's Talknosis. We're back with Emily Russo, a third time returning champion to Talknosis. You know her, you love her. She's a poet, she's a artist, she's a writer, she's a independent scholar, a professor, a... is there anything else that we should put in there, Emily? That sounds good. Yeah, I think that sounds pretty good, but there is more. There's more, folks. Look, she has a new, amazing, interactive course called Alchemy of the Word. As soon as I saw it go up on her website, I knew I had to speak to her about it. I'm actually going to take it right now. I'm a little overwhelmed with all the other things I'm supposed to be doing, but are not doing. And even though it's self-paced, I just know that I'll sign up for it and feel guilty. But look, you're watching and listening to this right now. Go to emilyrussell.com slash alchemy of the word. Sign up for the course. It'll literally be life-changing because that's probably part of the the purpose of the course. Emily, tell us about, about the course, like what it is. Um, thanks for that intro, John. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's the sort of a, um, I guess a combination of, uh, like deep dive into alchemy and its processes and metals and various associations and, and a little bit about its history. Um, and also a kind of, um, sort of application of alchemical principles to the creative process. So um, there's like a lot of, you know, quotes and images and information and studies from medieval and Renaissance, like old school alchemists proper. And then there's also a lot of um, stuff from artists and writers like Emily Dickinson and Rambo, who I lifted the title from, Alchemy of the Word, um, Durer, Leonora Carrington. Um, there's like some philosophers thrown in there, like Chris Deva and um, Carl Jung. And it's just kind of, it's like quite syncretic and um, kind of like very visual. There's there's a lot of slides and I, I kind of take take you on a little bit of a journey, I guess. Yeah. Can you talk more about some of your incorporation of, of the artists and writers that you that you just named? Because, uh, you know, we probably have listeners and watchers who have been like, you know, I've taken online alchemy courses before on the, the history of alchemy. Uh, you know, maybe even talk about specific texts or specific lab alchemy techniques. But, you know, what, what does Emily Dickinson have to do with this? What does uh, uh, Lenore, well, Lenore Carrington is actually a really good example. What, what, what does Rimbaud have to do with this? Can, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the how, the why, the thought process behind it, incorporating some of these artists into into the course? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think so. One of the things about alchemy, and I guess why I've been interested in it for so long is because it's really about much like astrology and a lot of like occult practices, it's about correspondences and associations. So I think um, one thing that it does is it can unlock um, ways that like seemingly unrelated things might actually be related. Um, so I kind of try do that in a sense in real time. So for instance, like, um, you know, I talk about um, Emily Dickinson, like, a, like a poem of hers in relation to, I believe, um, the metal lead and the planet Saturn and like the feeling of heaviness and winter and stuff. So, so there's a sense that like alchemy and its metals and its corresponding planets um, can also maybe help us to read artists and the world around us in different ways um, and like open up something cool, you know? Yeah. So everybody kind of comes to the show with, we got the real heads. Emily, we got the real heads, right? And then we have the people who, who are served up by by the YouTube algorithm. And of course, every show is somebody's first show. So we've talked quite a bit about alchemy on on the program, but at the same time, uh, there's still going to be people who hear the weird al hear the word alchemy and are thinking, okay, so is is this is, this is really cool? Is she is she whispering me Emily Dickinson poetry while turning me how telling me how to turn lead into gold? Like, isn't that all <laughs> alchemy is? It's, it's a fake science that led into real science where where people are you know crazy people are up all night uh uh the dumping sulfuric acid and their own urine onto lead hoping that it'll turn into into a precious metal yeah a lot of 
sulfuric acid and urine and um, strange bodily fluids and stuff going on in literally in literal alchemy. Um, so yeah, I'm not like in the lab, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So right, there is this sense of alchemy as being obviously a forerunner to what we think of now as chemistry or whatever. But there's also and and there's also you know the literal. I, well, I guess I'll I'll go back. There's sort of I think two broad goals of alchemy. Um, one would be to transmute base metals into gold, as you're saying. Um, literally trying to do this. And another one would be to find what they referred to as the universal elixir or a kind of medicine um, that could, that can cure um, and help along this process. But then there's also the kind of um, psychic and maybe like not as literal uh, way of viewing alchemy as just, you know, any kind of process of transmutation um, and a way of seeing how things are nested within each other. So they say that there's like so many like alchemical dictums and sayings and little poems and images. But, you know, one of the things that, that a lot of the alchemists said was um, that gold is hidden in the lead. So it's not really that we're starting from lead, whether literally or figuratively, like this pile of like chaotic, shit, you know, whether it's like words that you're trying to make into a novel or an idea that you're trying to, you know, figure out um, how it's going to manifest in real life or paint or whatever you're dealing with or any kind of problem. It's not that we're going from that into something like glimmering and worthwhile, but that we're kind of finding a way to think through that material um, and uncover what's already there, what's already present, the so-called gold and, and all the other metals. So to me, it's this like very interesting language and way of um, thinking about materials and psychic processes and creative modes in um, relationship with each other. Yeah, yeah. And not to break everything down to a cliche, but would you say with, with alchemy, however, we're going to encounter, be it uh, formal practices of inner alchemy, because there are forms of meditation out there, or this kind of creative exploration where we're taking in uh, our making these connections, looking at the, the seven classical planets, or even in the lab, is, is the journey the destination? <laughs> is the journey the destination so it's not it's not the it's it's not the uh the getting uh, the gold but it's not the having the gold in your hand but it is the process of getting to the gold yeah for sure it's the it's right what you said yeah um and i think um <clears throat> part of that journey or whatever is um kind of just <clears throat> um like entering into, I mean, you're talking, you know, I think there is this obviously age old cliche or whatever about alchemists um, being mad people, either going mad from the chemicals that they are working with <clears throat> or, and or, um, you know, what kind of person is going to try to turn base metals into gold you know um and and i think there is still that like kind of stigma right it's like oh it's like a, a kind of bullshit art or science or whatever um but i think i think it's actually qu quite interesting to think of it as this kind of impossible thing which a lot of artistic practices are they're like these impossible bizarre things that we do for god knows what reasons but um you know, I like this thing that James Hillman said, who who has an amazing book called um, something like The Psychology of Alchemy or some, something along those lines. Um, that one way to think about alchemy is as madmen at work upon themselves. So, so yeah, like they're working on metals or maybe psychic processes or whatever, but um, these processes and metals and modes are also working on them or working on us. So in a sense, like, 
it's this interesting thing that that is happening to us, not necessarily that we're inflicting on something else. Yeah, uh, I find we live in a, a horrible age of, of utility, right? You always have to be doing something with a clear goal at the end, and that clear goal usually has to be related to making money, self-improvement, world improvements. It's usually related to making money. Uh, so with with your course, is there a how or a why for taking it? Like, is it is it something somebody would want to take if they're working on an artistic process and perhaps they feel stuck? Uh, is it something that someone would want to take for uh, spiritual reasons? Is it something that uh, somebody would want to take for uh, uh, alchemical reasons? Is it, do you see like a, a how, a where, a when, a why with it? We do live in a horrible age of utility. I know, right? It's like everything. I mean, we've talked about this before on the Bataille episode because he's very anti-utilitarian and like in, into searching for the sacred, which he sees as not having some kind of immediate graspable potential or life purpose or whatever the buzzwords are now. Um, now I'm just like waxing and I have no idea what I'm, where I'm going with this. Um, right. Utility. Is there, is there a why? I mean, well, this is why, I mean, I don't know. Yes and no. I, I do classes. I, I often end up teaching classes at least in part because I want to learn about a certain thing. So I've always had, like, alchemy's always been kind of, like, swimming around in my head, and it's often, like, part of my work, and it seeps into my writing in different ways, and I've read things here and there, but I really wanted to go, like, full on, um, and I did, and it was weird, and I feel that I'm still kind of recovering. <laughs> it's a lot of, it's a lot. So I guess I see, I, I, I did it for that reason, partly, you know, and also partly to kind of in a sense, like distill and create a container for all of these wild texts that I had to kind of go far and wide to find on the on the internet um, and hopefully make it a little easier for people to kind of like find an entry point if they're like alchemically curious. Um, and yeah, like most of my classes are in real time um, online or, or not, but I, and, and often they're not recorded because I am a paranoid person <laughs> and I don't trust recordings. And also I just am like, are people going to really watch? Like, you know, I, I don't know, whatever. Lots of questions about recording. But um, I did this in a kind of like opposite way. You know, I recorded these um, lectures or presentations or whatever because I feel like the material is just super dense and I wanted people to be able to like go through it at any pace they wanted to and potentially like take as many projects through um, these alchemical stages, not necessarily in a hierarchical way, like, oh, you're going to definitely finish this in like three easy steps. You know, it's really nothing like that. It's much more deranged than that. Um, but hopefully like as a way to kind of, yeah, see a project in a different light or take it through these weird sieves, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and how did you first get interested in, in alchemy, uh, leading to the point of, as you said, it was swimming in your head so much that you, you had to do this project? <laughs> um, good question. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess two ways. One, like I'm an astrologer, I'm like a practicing astrologer, and astrology and alchemy are kind of like sister sciences uh, or arts or whatever. Um, the planets and the metals relate to each other in, in interesting ways. And the other way is I wrote a, a book of poetry slash essay slash whatever kind of strange book a few years ago or many, I don't know when I, I probably was working on it like 20 2010s or something and it came out in I guess like 2018 or 19 called Wave Archive and that book deals with um, kind of old school medical practices um, and ways of healing and uh, alchemy found its way into my head through like researching the humors and you know uh, techniques such as like, that involved like imbibing weird things and um you know 
skull trephination, stuff like that. Um, and also just thinking about, you know, what science and medicine was before it was the science and medicine that we know now. Um, so I, I did some research uh, on, on alchemy when I was working on that book. Um, and like poets are, I don't, like a lot of the poets I like seem to be interested in these worlds, like a lot of the modernist poets, like H.D. and Yeats and T.S. Eliot. So, you know, I feel like I, I run into it. We run into each other. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it, it's hard to express to just, you know, I, I, I want to know more about alchemy, about the history of alchemy, but how it was, it was relatively mainstream uh, among the intellectual classes for the last two, three thousand years um, up until the early 1800s, until uh, like that late. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there would have been times that it would have been persecuted or individual alchemists were persecuted. But for the most part, it, it was it was respected. And when it wasn't respected, it wasn't persecuted as witchcraft craft but it was made fun of right uh, because of the more lab alchemy you know like the ben johnson's uh the alchemist um you know the, the, the <laughs> you have the, these people these these trickster figures or uh a flim flim man um so you know when you when you are talking about uh artists if you go anytime before the 1800s uh you're going to have like this this strong um alchemy is is mainstream and an interest of, of intellectuals you know even somebody like uh um, like uh, the word sublimation is originally an alchemical term, right? I think it's Hegel that brings it into philosophical and then psychoanalytic uh, discourse. And Hegel had a strong interest in, in alchemy. So th there is th there is this current, uh, you know, and of course, some of the people that, that you do mention, like like Drewer, um, the, he would have been familiar with alchemy. So yeah, it, like it, there is direct connections with uh, a lot of artists and thinkers uh, up until modern times, but as, as you said, you, you know, as I said, it was it was still mainstream until the early 1800s. But then you have you know people uh, uh, like Yeats, uh, people interested in the occult who are looking uh, to alchemy, and and one of the reasons why people do look backwards to to alchemy, who who might be more modern, is the. Um, I mean, the connections between, I, I, okay, I feel like it's almost become hack now to, to point out the connections between um, non-figurative painting or surrealism and, and the occult, right? Because, you know, Kadinsky, of course, was, uh, was a theosophist. Uh, uh, Hilma Offklint has, has been having a moment for a number of years. Um, but these, these texts and some of the texts that you actually talk about in the course, they're, they're the next level when it comes to, to surreal, right? Both of some of the images and, and the journeys. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Some of these, these, these crazy alchemical dreams, some of these uh, emblems that, uh, that, that would blow apart like uh, 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 any, any ideas about representative, uh, re representative art? Yeah, you're right. There, um, there, there is this link between like surrealism and um, and alchemy and the occult. I mean, well, first of all, I think, I think um, there's something about these practices or substances, really. I guess that that the alchemists are dealing with, um, or the art or artists or whatever. That it they kind of um, they're very interested in this thing. I guess we, I guess like the philosophical term for it would be like pharmacon, um, but you know this term, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So this idea that, um, yeah, like, you know, it's a matter of dosage and the poison and the cure are kind of in the same uh, arena. And so it, there's a danger, you know, there's like, a, a, there. I think alchemy is seen as or has been seen as a kind of dangerous practice and even in the texts themselves like these really bonkers texts that are kind of hard to read but also like really poetic and interesting and mind bendy and filled with riddles they talk about there's you know there's there's so many warnings issued like um don't keep the substance too fast or you'll ruin it or don't do this or you'll die or you have to kind of die and then come back a little or you know like all of these sort sorts of levels of um ruining and curing and, and that whole scale so i feel like there's a lot in there's a lot in there um that has to do with like 
site or ways of making things um, that, you know, has to do with ways that vision might get blocked and fucked up and new visions emerge from that um, or, or potentially like super real or more real than real ways of seeing what's around. But then that's also like just in so much surrealist writing or painting or whatever, it's like this weird line um, because there's always this kind of going over the edge into something nonsensical or, or um, dangerous that's going to maybe show you something about your own dreams or or whatever and freak you out a little bit. So I think there's something about like making things and the substances that we're encountering and, and, and text as substance even, you know, that like speaks to the surreal thing you're talking about. Did I? No, absolutely not. <laughs> but I guess I guess staying with the text too, because of course uh, you're more than a fan of horror. It's 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 something that you and the grotesque is something that, that you bring into your work that you explore. Um, you know, in, in some of these texts, they, they are they are very extreme, right? There, there's a lot of there's there's sex and there's constantly like beheadings, you know, people dying, resurrections, uh, the, yes. the kings and queens mating and then becoming fused into androgynine uh, creatures. You know. It's, 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 it's weird, heavy stuff. Uh, and, and I think because of that, uh, it, it can feel startlingly modern, right? That, that it can feel like it is, it is a surreal text that, that somebody you know, wrote recently or wrote within the last, last 100 years. Um, I, I guess that that's more of a, a rant, but I'll put a question mark at the end of that <laughs> if, you, if you agree about some of, the, about some of those details. A rant question. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I actually hadn't um thought about it in that in that way. But yeah, I am interested in horror and I think a lot of these texts are certainly like OG horror. I mean, I go through a lot of them in the class. Um like some of the kind of classic ones, like the Twelve Keys of Basil Valentine, Splendor Solace, um, Donum Day, the Rosarium Philosophorum. They're they're are all of these recurring themes, as you mentioned, like um, people getting chopped up, uh, people getting like kind of dipped in weird vats of things. Yeah, kings and queens in staring at each other in like hot tub like situations. And then there's also um, a lot of like separations and mergings, you know, the kind of salve a coagula, which is like the main alchemical thing has it is all about simply like or simply not so simply ways of um dissolving and building back up or parting and coming together and so the text and and the corresponding images are totally freaky and ecstatic and violent because they show you the ways that through the personification of the metals via um kings and queens and men and women and all these all these different figures um you know, you get to kind of see the process and also how it works on, on the mind. So this is like then um, why Carl Jung got so interested in, and like, you know, psychologists got so interested and philosophers and artists got very interested in these texts because they show something um, in really imaginative, interesting ways that that's happening you know they externalize something that's happening inside and they call they refer to it as the torturing of the metals which is kind of a, an interesting way to say it i like that term um it's very metal yeah yeah it's totally metal um the do you have a uh, and if you can say why sometimes we have favorites and we don't even know why but of some of these alchemical texts you know is is there one in particular that uh that really spoke to you and uh and if so why yeah, there's a lot. There's, I mean, I love them. Um, I had to kind of take a break after I did the class because I was like looking at them for so long. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, I, I know from personal experience. Yeah. They do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I want to know. I think I mentioned to you, but I, uh, 
in, in the early 2000s, so there's uh, Adam McLean's Alchemy website. I'll link it for people. Um, and uh, particularly then in, with, with an earlier internet, um, you know, I, I would just get blasted and just spend a couple of hours just looking at the, the images. So, uh, so sorry, uh, continue, continue. Yeah, the on. one you sent me is really good. Um, oh, yeah, you know, I'll link that. And I really, I should just email Adam. I, I, I should see, see if he come on, should come on the show because I need to read the whole text out the interpretation. But again, for just for eeriness or uncanny is, is, is the proper term because it's it's it seems to be a young boy um probably associated with mercury because he's wearing a winged hat but he has no hands but he doesn't seem bummed about it he's just holding them up and there's almost a smile on his face and he's standing on a platform in like the middle of i guess which, which would be a swamp surrounded by marshes and it's just a an image has captured my imagination because of that almost smile he doesn't seem bummed and the lack of hands and it's both um, you know, there's something almost calming and picturesque about it being here among the thrushes, but at the same time, it's so uh, disturbing. Um, it, it's always one that's got my my imagination. But but of course, it's part of a sequence, so you know you need to understand the whole sequence, unlock what that image means, and it's it's one I haven't come back to in a while. But we're we're talking about you. Um, uh, if you if you have a favorite uh, a favorite text of the ones that you examine or talk about in the course. I mean, I like a lot of them, but yeah. Um... I do love there and there are usually, by the way, like so many iterations of, I guess you probably know of all of these texts. So yeah, on, on know, stable texts. Yeah. Yeah. They're liquid. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I love the Rosarium Philosophorum. Um, and I go through that one a lot in, in the, ta in the course, um, because it's kind of, it's, I mean, this is a weird word, but it seems almost like the most romantic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like boy meets girl. Um, but then a lot of weird stuff happens. There's this whole interesting sequence of like the king and the queen, king, king sun, queen moon, um, kind of like in bed and the bed turns into a tomb. Mm -hmm. And then there is like this winged creature, mercurial spirit who's leaving them and entering them and leaving them and entering them. And they kind of transmute then into like one and then they're two again. So it's this interesting kind of um, love story. Yeah, and we've you know we've uh, the, the, we've done the whole shows just on one text because you know we had somebody in to talk about the uh, Atlantia Fugians. I don't know if that's how you say it, but uh, it's it's like the first multimedia experience because it's images, it's text that you're probably supposed to read out loud to be honest, and also uh, there's music that goes along with it. So the music's transcribed into the text, but now you can have uh, you can listen to modern recordings. So again, for sort of being uh, ahead of the curve or uh, creating something that that wasn't there before that we would recognize as as modern art, uh, uh, multimedia done by the alchemists. Um, oh, cool. I mean, yeah, there's something really like, I think, um, I'm also just interested in like texts that people tell you or things that people have, have told us to stay away from, you know, I never trust that advice, which you and I were kind of talking about off air, but like, of like, don't read that or don't talk to that person or, or you're going to get contaminated by this or that. Um, and there's, you know, one of one of many like critics of alchemy, I think, it, you know, in maybe like the 18th or 19th century said something to the effect of like, um, basically like to even read these texts is to risk becoming tinctured with the kind of lunacy they set out to describe. Um, and so I've always been really interested in that that phrase in in Wave Archive, the book that I that I mentioned of mine. Um, there there are a few sections called "Tinctured with Lunacy," and it, it's re it's really dealing with this this thing of like how texts enter us and alter us. And of course, like maybe it is tincturing us with lunacy, but then like what do we do with that? So that's very interesting to me that there are these kind of kinds of uh, guardrails around it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, can you talk a, a little bit uh, more about Jung and his approach to alchemy and how it inspired you or how it's incorporated into the course? Yeah. Um, well, he, I mean, there's a lot about him and I, I'm just like a kind of novice. Um, I'm just sort of starting to deep dive into him. But he became, he sort of was, recognizing the psychological 
work that the alchemists were doing and how alchemy, the, the literal practice of it was an analog for the, the kinds of like psychoanalytic work that he was talking about and dream work and, and all of this. So he spent time with these texts, almost like translating them for, I don't know, I guess how we so-called modern people think or whatever, you know? Um, and it's interesting. He has, he has a whole book called Alchemical Studies where he goes into all of this and does like really intense um, interpretations of various texts. Um, and also he has this amazing long book that I'm kind of like slogging through called um, Mysterium Conjunctiones, which is like a beautiful phrase. Um, and he talks about, um, I mean, yeah, he, it, it's just a long, long book on alchemy. And he, so I think he's that he's contributed like a lot, you know, to, to alchemical research and how we think of it now. Um, I feel like my like entry point into Carl Jung was James Hillman, who I like, really have always admired and he talks a lot about alchemy as a kind of more imaginative image-based way of thinking about psychology um and a way of like turning our attention outward instead of um drearily inward um so that we can see ourselves and others better um and, and he kind of has i don't know interesting glosses on Jung, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Jung is just totally fascinating, but I think a lot of the so-called academy kind of wrote him off for his in interests. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, um, there's been a bit of a backlash in, in some circles. I don't know how serious this is. Uh, by some circles, I mean internet message boards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about, you know, until until Jung, you know, the, this idea of, of internal alchemy or of it being about the mind or doing practices, because, you know, there are specific meditations uh, that people call internal alchemy. You know, none of that really existed before Jung, and he sort of invented the idea and popularized it. But it, it's... Um, I, I, I think there's a little bit of truth to that in that, you know, he, he does psychologize it in, in a very specific way, uh, in a Jungian way, uh, through, through the lens of Dr. Carl Jung. Um, uh, I, I think that is true, but, but it's impossible to read these texts and read about some of the people who created these texts and think that they are strictly talking about lab alchemy. And of course, again, when we are trying to look back at things and put them into our categories, there is this kind of break, uh, you know, breaking down of barriers in alchemy where the internal and external uh, are broken down, right? And to create the, the gold in the lab uh, or to create the philosopher's stone, you need to have everything that's inside kind of reorientated. You know, the barriers need to be broken down. So not a question there, but just uh, I have no idea how, how serious that, 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 uh, that lashback is. Uh, but I, um, uh, uh, internet message boards, people, uh, that said, uh, the, I, I think there is a tiny kernel of truth to it, but, but it is, it is overblown. And, you know, we, we know one of the great, um, uh, uniting, uh, practices between the East and the West is actually alchemy. So, so alchemy is in, uh, incredibly important and has a very long history in India, in China, um, uh, uh, the whatever we think of as the, as the East. And, uh, there's also a very long history of internal alchemy practices there, um, where they've been taught for hundreds, uh, you know, the, the, in some cases of millennia, uh, where people have taken these metaphors and, and directly applied them to, uh, to the self. Um, coming back to, to the planets, so, so for people who, who would be kind of unfamiliar, can you tell us a little bit more about the seven classical planets and how they're not just these, these rocks in the sky, how they do sort of resonate throughout the cosmos with these, these correspondences that you're talking about, you know, metals, flowers, plants, uh, uh, animals, what have you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Well, I guess I'll say one thing about this, like internal versus external alchemy stuff, which is, you know, a, a lot of these or some of these like sort of Renaissance alchemical texts talk about a kind of dark fire or that's material and destructive. And then they also talk about a kind of invisible fire um, that's transformative. Um, and they talk about it in a way that feels a lot like these kind of inner practices. And I think in, in ways that kind of make me think about um, 
like the fire of hell versus the fire of something like Dante's purgatory, which is like transformative and meant to like change us, you know? So I think like so much of alchemy is about fire and like ways of working with fire and getting burnt by fire, not burnt by fire, um, ways of keeping the heat going. Um, and like this kind of line between creation and destruction, if that makes sense. So I think, yeah, I mean that to me, that's, one way of thinking about it um but yeah the planets also related to fire the sun being the kind of um correspondence to gold um and also like the center the center of the solar system obviously the heart of alchemy the heart of of the matter um and yeah all of all of the planets are or i guess i'll say a way of a way that the alchemists talk about their work is as a kind of grounded or geological, I guess, um, astrology or astronomy. And so the planets um, are seen and felt and evidenced here on Earth via the metals. And they um, are kind of, I guess, in, in constant conversation and one of these alchemical phrases as above so below just like hermetic law of correspondences has to do also with you know the planets in the sky and the metals down here um so yeah there's just like a whole kind of language around all of these planets like saturn jupiter um sun silver etc um and and i guess to me, it's a it's just a sort of way of seeing and reading like Saturn being the planetary correspondence of the metal lead, for instance. And, you know, Saturn moves very slowly through the sky and has a way of uh, of being in time or thinking about time that um, is much slower than, say, the moon um, or the sun. And so it comes to represent a kind of um, heaviness and the weight of time and then and, and lead corresponds to that because it's so heavy and it's sort of like the beginning of the work. So um, you kind of, I guess, can learn to read via those connections, if that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, you kind of touched on this, I mean, right now, but also at the beginning, but I what do you think of the theory is so th this is what I, i've heard explained uh for the quote unquote utility the reason for kabbalah uh the kabbalistic tree of life when it's when it's often used in uh in uh modern uh, occult settings or or a book like uh, crowley's uh, 777 which is you make so many correspondences between these different things that it starts it's it's a trick to make your brain see how the world and the universe and yourself are interconnected so those connections may not literally be there but it's a way to reorientate your vision reorientate and destabilize uh, your sense of self so i'm just wondering what you what you think of that idea um yeah i mean i i think <laughs> i think that it makes sense be especially um because mercury is a planet but also in a sense the essence of alchemy um is like the trickster god and the trickster metal it's this glimmering um also this glimmering planet that they originally thought was two planets because it looks so different depending on the time of year or day so there is this way in which mercury who rules over astrology and alchemy and also poetry and thieves and, and uh traveling and, and many different things uh, all kinds of dexterity and um the various like poisons and uh anti-poisons that that come with that um yeah i mean mercury is the essence of this art and and mercury is a trickster and so i think there's something about um alchemy that teaches or something teaches us how to see the truth in the trick i guess or what whatever that thing that I can't remember that Nietzsche said about um, art being a kind of a, a way to handle or take reality. Otherwise, we would die of, of 
reality, you know. So. I can't remember the exact quote either. I'll uh, I'll edit it in later. I'll t- <laughs> people won't yeah, even know. Make it. us sound yeah. smarter later. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that's how I, so yeah, I mean, yes, I guess, but also in the sense that the different kind of utility then, yeah. like, I'm, I kind of cr- like cringe at these like step-by-step tool-based practices, although I understand that they can be helpful, but I personally, I, I don't approach alchemy like that, but of course you can and people do. Yeah. Yeah. Um the uh, I think it might have been Jung who who said that that actually uh, alchemy was one of the the vectors that carried Gnosticism forward for, throughout mm-hmm. history. It's obviously it, it predates Gnosticism, but uh, the, if you're talking about the classical Gnostics of the the first, second, and third centuries, it does seem that that Gnosticism uh, that alchemy is very important to them. Uh, I'm not smart enough, but there is some intellectual work, uh, academic work done on this, and there are some alchemical metaphors uh, in some of the the major Gnostic texts, like like the Secret Book of John. Um, mm-hmm. And then later we have uh, Zosimos of Panopolis. Uh, we have a whole show on him. You know, he's he's a very important uh, early uh, alchemist who is very inspirational to um, to later alchemists. Um, and again, talking about that sort of exterior interior divide. You know, he's he's one of the earliest Western writers that we have that really uh, kind of talks about the interior. He uh, is in dialogue with the Gnostics, uh, even though he's a, a pagan Egyptian priest. He's bringing in a lot of Gnostic thought. Um, and uh, I, so, so for me, you know, my, my interpretation of, Gnost- of, of what the Gnostics were saying and, um, and other people's interpretation as well, you know, the, the cliche is, is that, that the body is a prison. But, but if you look to what people in the first, second, and third century were saying in the Mediterranean intellectual elite, they're all, for the most part, most of them, I shouldn't say all, are, are having issues with the body, right? So they're really not saying anything else that, that the Platonists aren't saying and definitely not what the Stoics, you know, they're definitely in agreement with the Stoics or what you can find Paul saying in the New Testament. So what what is, you know, uh, Gnosticism talking about when it comes to its liberation? Um, and I, I think what you were just talking about, about finding this truth in the trick, or again, going back to the beginning, it's you're not transforming something into gold you're you're discovering that the gold's already there or you're letting it know that the gold is already there so do you see a kind of um gnostic liberatory you know the freedom that that comes out of of alchemical work yeah maybe i need more i mean i mean i need i'm like so interested in what you're saying because i do think i do see a connect a link obviously between gnosticism and alchemy and yeah i i quote from Zosimos, he's in there. Um, and he's really fascinating. But I think for me, it's so hard to wrap my head around. Maybe this is typical, but like, it's just Gnosticism feels so like such a huge thing. And so sometimes I'm like, I don't quite know if I, like what what is Gnostic, what is Gnostic and what isn't. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's a really good point because I don't think anybody does. <laughs> anybody, <laughs> everybody who does say that say they know is, is a liar. You know, I, I I've lately just been able to say, you know, I don't know what is Gnostic, but I know what's not. You know, so I can point mm-hmm. to a few things and say, well, that's not. Um, and I think the problem is as well, say you're working within side a, a Gnostic system, if you are, quote unquote, a modern Gnostic. Um, well, like any religion, it's it's a totalizing system. Right. So that that makes things difficult, because mm-hmm. if you're if you're a Christian, if you're a philosophical Christian, well, everything's Christianity. Right. Well, Nietzsche is Christianity because, you know, it's uh, it, every, every you know, the logos is, is everything and everywhere. So, uh, so so I think that's one issue working within the system. But I think outside the system, Emily, what I coming coming to a thesis near you. Uh, eventually <laughs> see i know helen's gonna be watching this sorry helen sorry question um is, is the, the in an upcoming thesis is that gnosticism is uh, in my opinion really is much more in, influential than we realize it's really just so soaked into the background uh mm-hmm. even though it, it was this relatively uh uh well, I was about to say small quirky sect. That's not true. It, it it was more important than we thought, and then it just goes into the unconscious of the West. So it does make it, it very difficult to determine what's quote unquote gnostic and what's not, because it it just has really sunk in there through all sorts of um um 
vectors of uh, the earlier off air when you know we were talking about uh, uh, contagion, but there's all sorts of weird vectors that I feel carry uh, Gnostic ideas all around our society, and and of course you know it's it is uh, obscure in many ways, and we don't know much about it, um, but at the same time it's it's omnipresent. Um, so uh, that that's my opinion on it, and I think that's uh, also brings up the the, the the anybody who shares my opinion would also be able to point to uh, lots of things and say, well, it's really hard to say if that's Gnostic and that's not, or maybe that's originally a Gnostic idea or an idea that's um, been uh, pushed forward by the Gnostics or uplifted by the Gnostics or made more popular by the Gnostics, and that's why we know about it, but it's not specifically mm -hmm. a Gnostic idea or it's become cut off from um, uh, 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 larger Gnostics. Hey, a scholar that, that we, we both know and like, uh, a certain Dr. Nina Power, I heard her say uh, recently that uh, that we live in a uh, a Gnostic society, but it is it is a form of Gnosticism with no hope. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought that was really was really profound because I, I think that is true that you know quote unquote true Gnosticism does does have hope um, and it does have this liberation. But what we have now is just you know half the system. <laughs> um, we just have. Half of the we have all the um, the bad ideas uh, that Gnosticism spreads around about any of the good ones. If that makes sense. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm curious. I think that that makes sense. I mean, it's sort of like Gnosticism without the mysticism or something. Or, yeah. but what? So what do you? I mean, feel free to. I, mean, I know this is maybe off topic, but what do you see as like the bad? Gnostic ideas that are pervasive or something. Yeah, that's that's a really great question. You know, I, I think one of the main ones might be this this the simplistic idea of the body as a prison and that we need to um, get out of the body and be free of the body. And, um, you know, and, and I think that uh, if we're going to talk about living in a Gnostic society, you know, we we do that by uh, our, our um, you know, not sound too much like a Luddite or, or a boomer. Um, I love the Internet, folks. You I, you do, too, or you wouldn't be watching or listening to this show. But, you know, now we, we have the literal means to to do that. Right. It's, it's not a metaphor. Right. I can I can have a non non bodily existence. Um, so I, I think that the associating this, this very specific simplistic idea with Gnosticism is in many ways incorrect. But I feel that because of Gnosticism's influence on, on the West, it is one of the vectors for spreading it, if that makes sense. It's a misunderstanding what the Gnostics are trying to say about the body, but it, it may we may be able to trace it back to some Gnostic bodies of thought. Does that make sense? Um, and, yeah. and I think what they're saying about the body, um, I mean, I don't think it's that much different than, than what's in Plato. Um, and in some ways, I, I think they actually have nicer things to, to say about the body. Um, so I, I think it's a very simplistic misunderstanding. Um, now, I'm not going to say that, that some of the sects love the body, and that's the other problem, too, is that Gnosticism was a family of, of religion and is still a family of, uh, of different uh, kind of schools of thought. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, this very simplistic idea of, of body bad, spirit good, which mm -hmm. I think is what most people think of when they hear the word. And you know, I've been in, you know, I've been doing the show, I've been so in my head uh, for so long that that like, I forget that when I, I uh, when I'm talking to normal people, that if I say I'm interested in Gnosticism, that that's, that's immediately what, what they think that that, that it's about and what what I mean, mm -hmm. right? Is is that the the body is bad and it's a it's it's a, a trap for the spirit, um, and the whole point is to to get out of this world, to get out of this this body. Um, and, and to be honest, as I said, you know, I keep coming back to most of these ideas are, are in Plato. Like I, you know, I I would actually say that the, the um, some interpretations of, of of Plato and Platonism are probably more say that yeah. uh, in, a, in a simplistic way where, um, you know, the next question for me, uh, although we're interviewing you, would be, well, hey, John, <laughs> what are they saying about the body? Well, I think what they have to say is is very complex, um, yeah. which which lets me hand wave it because you know, we wouldn't have the time. But I, I think that it is it is complex. Um, and uh, I, I think the liberation that Gnosticism offers is, is always has an asterisk next to it, which is, you know, they're, they're actually big fans of Socrates, right? And uh, I, I believe that the term Gnostic knower is meant to be a little bit ironic, because what you're supposed to know is, is, is that you know nothing. There is an extreme humbleness that, uh, that, that, that is supposed to uh, uh, be developed within oneself. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the Gnostic messages is, is, is anything can be a trap. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. It, it can be a trap. Um, and once you've gotten out of that trap, the next thing that that, that liberates you can also be made into a trap. Um, 
And uh, uh, so that 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 also, I'm tying this back up with a bow, comes back to some of the more liberatory uh, aspects of alchemy, right? Because I think this this emphasis on liberation, even though it is always tricky, always a process, and there, there's always another trap uh, waiting for us around the corner, is still what what Gnosticism is is about. Um, and I think alchemy uh, uh, has that. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons why it's a vector of uh, of um, of uh, um, uh, contamination for Gnosticism. Yeah. Um, I think it has more specific things too, right? Because you have Sophianic, sometimes they just call her Sophia. They have Sophianic figures in, in the alchemical myths a lot, right? There are ideas of like, you know, spirit being trapped in, in matter. Sometimes you even have hints of demiurgic figures. So, um, but uh, that's that was my long rant. Uh, there's no question to mark at the end of that, but do you have anything to, to add to that? No, that's fascinating. Thank you for going into it. Because um, I think about this, this a lot but i think um yeah i mean what you're saying about the kind of paradox i guess of the body that it's both maybe a vector for change and transmutation and, and like a vessel and also a trap i think does relate to this alchemical thing of poison and cure in one um i think there's something really um paradoxical and poetic uh, and ungraspable maybe about how you're talking about Gnosticism and um, alchemy, a lot of the alchemical texts. Like I think there are certainly a lot of texts that talk about the body as being something to escape, but also there's a way in which it's it's really about, and if you can kind of see this in the images in, the t in some of the texts. It's sort of also about escaping it so that you can, or not escaping it, but sort of dealing with it in such a way that you come back to it changed. Yeah. Um, and it shows this in really interesting ways, right, of like the two people meeting and regarding each other and then like coming together and dismembering, dismembering uh, each other and um, having sex and mating and then like fighting and, you know, all these things um, that then, then in the end, there's like a new thing made from these unions and separations that's not like, you know, going off into the sky departing, but it's like being here in a different manner, um, which is quite interesting. I guess another like analog for the body maybe and alchemy would be the container, like the alchemical vessel, which is, I mean, like, so fascinating the way they talk about it. And it's um, really important, like the way that the way that you're supposed to keep the container heated and how things are interacting in the container and the container itself as being this kind of, um, yeah, we could say, I guess, prison and thing that makes everything possible. So it's sort of... I mean, it's always both, but I think there is a kind of, yeah, maybe, maybe like dystopia. You explained it a lot better than me. And uh, even though I didn't quite go there, but that's it exactly. And actually the alchemical vessel, I'm going to steal it. That's that, that is the metaphor, right? It is, it is in some ways a prison, but it's what makes things possible. And you, that also almost sounds almost again, like, like hacker cliche, but you know, I do see Gnosticism as, as radically incarnational. Um, it's uh, it's yeah. it's taking the the Jesus myth to to the next level, right? Um, and in some ways, it's uh, it's bringing uh, heaven down to Main Street. Uh, everything does get incarnated into matter, and if you read the myths, you know carefully, uh, it is it is God's wisdom that that causes this, and um, uh, it, it's God's wisdom that causes it because wisdom can't be wisdom. Um, uh, through just by being creative, right? Uh, wisdom, right. The, the wisdom needs the, uh, uh, the, now I'm mixing my metaphors, right? <laughs> but it needs the alchemical process. You know, yeah. it, it, we have to, we have to hold the, uh, the container full of the alchemical fluids up to the fire to, to get to the, to, to the result. Uh, we can't think about it or read it. It has to be done. Uh, uh, lives have to be lived for wisdom to develop. It's at the same, like, that's not that, that hard or deep of a metaphor at the end of the day. And sometimes I actually wish it was more complicated uh, so that I could, you know, appear smarter. Um, and, you know, when I, when I do say stuff like that, it's, uh, I, I don't want, I, I think another thing I like about Gnosticism is, is I really do think uh, it, it takes suffering and darkness uh, seriously. 
Um, and um, so, so I don't want to wave my hand and say it's all part of a process, man, or this is God's plan. You know, I, I think it's messier than that. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, this is uh, uh, the, the world of becoming is, uh, is here for a reason because it is part of the process. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think, I mean, I think it's like same, like in alchemy, the, the primal material or like what we're working with. Um, yeah. I mean, it's like, it's interesting because there are like infinite names for this primal material. There's so many and there's like, some of them are really like kind of sky culty, like <laughs> celestial and um, spirit, spirit, oriented and some of them are like you know very in the dirt and um yeah like like urine and gross bodily fluids that are also holy in this way um so like the base matter i guess what george bataille would call base matter is always there and you kind of can't forget about it and it's it's both in this weird way what you're starting with and the goal yeah exactly well, we're uh, we're almost at an hour, so it's been. You should wrap it up, although we could go all night, I'm sure. Uh, Emily, will uh, let's do the plug one, one more time. It's really easy, folks. It's uh, EmilyRusso.com, <laughs> and uh, I have a slash alchemy dot of the word, whatever. Just go to her website. You can you can buy her books. You can you have a new book of poetry that people can read and download for free. Is that right on the website? Yeah, right on the website, Magenta. It's released into the ether for you. Yeah, so so check that out. Uh, oh, I'll do my commercial uh, Patreon dot com slash Gnostic. Uh, if you go to that website, you'll see that we offer things for uh, supporting us. That's that's a lie. But if you want to do it out of the goodness of your heart, please do. Um, when I have the time, I give you early access to the episodes. I'm trying to get better about giving more to our patrons. But what we don't want to do is is have stuff behind a paywall, like exclusive content, because we want to have it all out there. Because we're all about uh, spreading the uh, spreading the gnosis. Uh, and if you if you want something for signing up for the Patreon, or you have some good ideas about what might encourage people, uh, go ahead and do so. But you can uh, support the show for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, and uh, you will get um, uh, early access to the shows sometimes. I'm also trying to work on a few. I have a few things cooking. I have a few things cooking about what I want with the patrons. I just need. Uh, the time. Uh, you can do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. You know, we, we never really talked about, uh, I mean, it's all in there, but like plant alchemy or the specific, you know, philosopher's stone medicine-based alchemy. But, you know, I did want to end uh, the time of my dream that, you know, someday I want to, like, move to the country and then, like, have, like, a big rambling house and, and have my own alchemical lab because it is, <laughs> doing doing lab alchemy is very time-consuming, right? So it's like, you know, if I ever got to retire, which, of course, I'm a millennial, so I probably won't, but, you know, um, uh, uh, and also, the part, the part of this dream is that um, um, it, it, I would be far away from, from where uh, I could burn down cities or my own house. You know, I'm, I'm also very clumsy. Uh, I don't think my wife would like this idea of me uh, in a lab sur surrounded by <laughs> uh, beakers. <laughs> I guess the most, the, the best, like, contemporary alchemical show is uh, Breaking Bad. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Good example. <laughs> Okay. So it would be like that, but you wouldn't be. I'm assuming you wouldn't be cooking meth, but yeah. you know, no judgment. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of the that, that I mean, maybe that you know, daytime to pay for all the alchemical. Yeah. Alchemical there you go. Night, and then yeah, and then at night, you know, work on the uh, 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 on the plant alchemy. Okay. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> it's been uh, it's been a blast. Thanks, John. Bye.